That'll do. All right. Some of these terms are going to be the same. Some are going to be slightly different. Advocate's not one of them. Degree of warfare and legitimacy are two that we're going to look at. So to start off with a map. Maps are so great. They tell us all kinds of pieces of information. For instance, this shows us the continental system. Uh, France, after its conquest, as well as forcing people into this agreement, wherein we're going to sort of unify all of Europe under one rule. However, uh, Napoleon goes about this in some pretty uh, antagonistic ways. Napoleon is nothing if not antagonistic. For instance, he's going to conquer Spain and place his brother on the throne. His brother's name is Joseph. When he places his brother on the throne, this is an obvious antagonization of the Spanish people. But in addition, they set about weakening the Spanish Catholic Church, which is going to antagonize them further and cause rebellions from within the country. Now, here's the problem with this. They're not going to fight Napoleon. He's got the best army in the world. So it wouldn't make any sense to have a bunch of ragtag rebels fight against the most powerful army in the world in a straight-up fight. They will lose. So instead, they adopt a new set of tactics that involve little wars, or guerrilla. It actually isn't guerrilla. We'll say guerrilla, and that's not really accurate. For one thing, guerrillas are big, ape-like monkey things. Guerrillas are little wars, little battles. What types of little battles? Things that are annoying, but aren't going to overcommit troops. You see, the worst mistake the rebellion could make is to flat out attack Napoleon. If they do that, they're going to lose the fight, which could put an end to the rebellion. So they refuse to fight him in open ground. They always attack from cover and disappear after a few casualties are inflicted. They'll shoot them up while they're marching in column. They'll blow up food supplies. They'll poison wells. All kinds of little tiny things that really are just pen pricks, but really hurts the morale of the French troops stationed there. Now this is going to have another, much more important effect down the line. You see, in order to contain these guerrillas, to keep them uh, from really doing too much damage, they have to commit a lot of troops to help deal with the situation. That leads to Napoleon overcommitting. He's putting too many troops in Spain, and that means he doesn't have the troops at his disposal when he goes and fights his wars with Austria and Russia. It's going to severely weaken him and lead to his downfall. So don't be misinformed. Even though the guerrilla fighting is small, doesn't mean it isn't effective. Consider this. Ultimately, it is morale that determines whether or not a war is won or it is lost. The soldiers and their officers are the ones, ultimately, who decide whether or not they're going to win or lose. It's whether we give up or not. So guerrilla tactics revolve around this idea and trying to make it as costly as possible to the point where people just say, no, it's just not even working. There's more than one way to inflict damage on the enemy. So this rebellion in Spain is going to lead to a rebellion in Austria. They, however, are going to be crushed by Napoleon's army, and he is going to have to deal with this situation in another way. You see, one of the big problems these rebellions have to revolve around is the idea of legitimacy. Every monarch has to be related to the previous monarch by blood somehow, usually with a very strong connection. For instance, the child of a previous monarch has a much stronger tie than a third cousin twice removed. However, Napoleon does not have any ties to the thrones of king or kingdoms, I should say, of Europe. So he needs to get one. 
So he divorces his wife, Josephine, and marries an Austrian princess so that any of his children with her will be heirs to the Habsburg dynasty. What's interesting about this is it seems like he just traded in his wife for a younger model, a younger royal model. But Josephine actually suggested the idea to her husband as a means of controlling the Austrians, forming a proper Austrian-French alliance. Uh, Josephine's an interesting lady. Uh, for one thing, they had a really good relationship, and she was really supportive and, and really kind of a partner in a lot of Napoleon's schemes. So it's not like she was just the wife who was kind of the hanger on. She was very much a part of this whole thing. And uh, their, their love story is legendary. And yet it's interesting that he, she encouraged her husband, hey, go marry somebody else so that we can do this, this thing together. It's, it's, it's very interesting. Anywho, what happens, though, is by forming this alliance, that's a little too much for Russia. So Russia ends up pulling out of the continental system. They decide, yeah, we've had enough. This is the excuse that Napoleon's been wanting so that he can try invading Russia. Russia is the crown jewel. They can take Russia. There's no one else in the European landmass that can stop it. Sure, there's England, but they're an island. And if you're an island, you're isolated. So Russia is sort of the key to the whole thing, the lynch and Russia, you have to understand, is an imposing target to invade. It is enormous. It is a very, very big place. It's also very, very cold. Russian winters can get to like negative 60 degrees. Now just ponder that for a second. As cold as our winters get, minus 60 more degrees. Think about how big the difference is, how big the jump is between 80 degrees and 20 degrees. All right, that's that again. We're talking cold to a level you guys have never experienced and probably never will. We're talking fatally cold. Can you bathroom that? Oh, yeah. Okay. Easy. Uh, you fall in water in that, you've got maybe a few seconds. Wait, what? Yeah. You like freeze them on the ice? Yeah. That's probably like you would you know, turn into an icicle. But yeah, it, it, water like that sucks the heat out of you faster than air does. Um, sort of like if you guys have ever seen um, Deadly's Catch. Oh, yeah. You know that water and drinks. Okay. You fall out in water like that, you've got a minute, maybe two, and you're dead. It's too cold. Uh, same sort of situation. So we're talking pretty terrible situation for people who want to invade during the winter. Not to mention all the snow and ice makes it really difficult to move around. Your soldiers are having trouble staying warm, but also from getting point A to point B. And that's not even taking into consideration the most difficult aspect of running an army. It's not about training. It's not about weapons. It's about food. Consider this. How many calories does a soldier use in one day? Calories. Calories. Uh, usually it's between three and six thousand, depending on the situation. How much do we need in a day? Two. So they need a lot more calories than we do. So you got to feed them, yeah? Here's the problem. Let's talk weight of food. You guys know what the most common food item for the French was at this time in history? Crumpets. Okay. Guys, think about it. What was the rebellion with all the women? Bread! There we are. That's the thing, bread. So bread is an important part of the diet. Bread is not maybe the heaviest thing in the world. I mean, you know, you get a nice size loaf of bread for a pound or so. Well, let's consider this. The average Frenchman ate between uh, one and two pounds of bread per day. In addition, uh, the most easily carried around, the most compact food at the time, was soup. I mean, think about it. A can of soup, that's really easy to carry around, yeah? All right. So imagine, first of all, imagine eating soup for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. I'm going to get old. But you know, hey, welcome to the Army. So let's talk about three cans of soup. 
right? How much does a can of soup weigh? 18 ounces. Not quite that much. 16 ounces. Eight, eight, well, depending on yeah. the plan. So let's say for sake of argument that you could have four pounds of food per day. Does that make sense? You know, for bread and for soup, right? Four pounds a day, right? So how long does this campaign last? Eight months. Whatever you add it all together for the 400,000 troops in the Grand Army, it comes up to something like 480 billion pounds of food. How are you gonna move all that? Well, here's the here's the here's the trick. Because obviously the troops can't carry it. Because that's just talking food. I'm not talking about cannons. I'm not talking about guns and swords and pipes. Well, they don't really use pipes, but the bayonets. I'm not talking about all the accoutrements, the cartridges, the powder, the bullets, the boxes, all that. The average soldier has like 50 pounds on their back. There's no way they carry that much food. Can't ship it by overland either, not without really risking some problems. Because if you're shipping these big crates of food overland, that's a perfect thing to attack. If you're the enemy, that's what you want to blow up. Because if you get all the food out, the troops are going to starve to death. So the trick is actually an old strategy that was developed by Sun Tzu, it was used throughout the world. It's called feeding on your enemy. That means is, as you are marching, you have your troops steal food from your enemy's stores. Go to farms, take their food. Go to stores, take the food. Just feed off of them. Feed your entire army off the food you steal from the enemy. That does two things. One, you don't have to worry about supplies because you're taking it from the enemy. And two, it weakens the enemy because they're using up their supplies. It's a great strategy. However, when Napoleon takes his army and invades Russia, they see the army coming, and they respond with another technique called the scorched earth. Basically, peasants would you know, be sitting to their farms, they would see the army coming, they would burn their fields to the ground. They'd take whatever food they needed they could carry to survive on, they would flee, but before they left, they would kill any animals that couldn't go with them, they would burn fields, they would do everything so that when the army got there, there was no food. So in order to keep his troops from starving, Napoleon had to ship over these massive crates of food, and of course the Russians were attacking back. But all this time they refused to engage Napoleon's army directly. So he kept taking territory, but there was nothing there. He even took the capital of Moscow, and the Tsar just kind of shrugged whatever you can have it. And then winter set it. And now Napoleon's stuck. He needs the supplies uh, to stay, if he's going to stay, but Russian winters take a lot of preparation. He has no preparation, so his troops have got to leave. So they start coming back into France, coming back the way they came, and they're dying of starvation and cold. And then the Russian army shows up, because, yeah, they're used to this weather. So they've got their big, heavy fur-lined coats, and they're on skis and things like that. And they're taking pot shots at the French and killing them, and so... You know, there's all these really terrible situations that the French are fleeing from this disastrous invasion of Russia. The worst part is when people, when the army would get to a bridge. Bridge fighting is, is terrible because there's only one tiny little place you can put your army. So they're bottlenecked. Their numbers are irrelevant because they're only a small trickle getting across. So the Russians show up and they start attacking them as they're trying to cross the river. Well, to get to safety, they have two options. Wait your turn across the bridge, or take a chance and try swimming across the river. Now, it's not that far all the time. Like I said, it's not like the Ohio necessarily. It can be much smaller than that, but think of how cold it is. And you're weighted down with 60 pounds of gear. So maybe you strip off your gun and throw everything down, but now you're without an arm, and you try to swim across the river, you die of cold, or you drown, or you wait your turn and possibly get shot kind of a damned if you do damned if you don't situation. The 400,000 that left France, when they get back, there's only 10,000 left. 390,000 French troops died in this disaster. Winter and scorched earth, starvation, do what no army could have done. They defeat the French army. And this is severely weakening in France. 
So the rest of Europe sees this and says, now is the time to attack. So they engage Napoleon at the Battle of Nations at Leipzig, where he is defeated for the first time. So Leipzig is significant because it's the first time that Napoleon is defeated. However, understand, his armies were incredibly good. They were victorious in many other instances. Uh, this is the Arc de Triomphe. It is a edifice that was erected by Napoleon to celebrate his victories. And uh, it's actually stylized after the arches built by the ancient Romans. It's actually a pretty cool structure if you get a chance to see it sometimes in Paris. It's actually quite large, too. It's actually big enough for four lanes of traffic. So it's pretty big. Um, so what happens in Napoleon's defeat? Well, Napoleon is put under house arrest. He's shipped off to an island. And Louis XVIII, the descendant of Louis XVI, is placed on the throne. And so when he's on the throne, the emigres who refused to come back under Napoleon now start flocking back to France, ready to get revenge on the revolutionaries who had ousted them those many years ago. So the French people start panicking. This is good. We're going to go back exactly like it was in Louis XVI, the same problems. And so their spirit hasn't been beaten out of them. So they end up rising in revolution again and go break Napoleon out of jail where he is returned to France. He meets his army and marches to Paris. And as the army's coming in, Napoleon, or excuse me, Louis flees and Napoleon is uncontested. Louis is not going to fight Napoleon. He is the popular support of the people and he ends up returning to Paris uh, as a hero. People are cheering for him, things like that. So this begins his second reign, which lasts for 100 days and is known as the 100 days. So that's why it's called that. While this is going on, the various nations who defeated him are having a peace conference where they're discussing what the plan is going to be now that Napoleon's been defeated. Well, guess what? Napoleon's back. So they muster their armies and meet him at Waterloo. Now, this is the deciding battle that obviously Napoleon is going to lose and sort of his swan song. Now, what's interesting about Waterloo is this again shows Napoleon's greatest weakness, his greatest problem, geography. Geography does more to defeat Napoleon than any general does. Yeah, Wellington is supposed to have defeated him, but really it's geography. For instance, consider this, Russia. What defeated him? The cold, geography, the temperature, the size of it, and having to ship all those sources. Another thing, with Waterloo, what was his number one most experienced usage of weapon systems? What was Napoleon the best with in terms of weapons? Artillery, sure. Now let's talk how artillery is deadly, right? It's actually really hard to hit somebody with a cannonball. You know, it's cannonballs that, you know, maybe that big, if it's a giant cannon, and you're going to hit a target that's several hundred yards away. Now, the idea is you make a cannonball sort of like a bowling ball. It hits the ground and it bounces, right? If it's hard, hard if, it's, if it's earth, it's going to bounce, it's going to roll, and it's going to do all kinds of damage as it goes, okay? Well, what happens with Napoleon at Waterloo is... He's trying to wait for the proper time to attack, and the rain sets in. And the rain ends up soaking the earth and turn off soupy and muddy and gross. So when the cannons go off, the cannonball sticks in the dirt and doesn't do near as much damage. Furthermore, the problem with gunpowder is it is hydroscopic, meaning it sucks up moisture and becomes useless. So whenever you have wet gunpowder, it turns into this black sludge which gums up the inner workings of your guns where you can't use them anymore. So it really makes his main weapon ineffective. In addition, he also relied heavily on cavalry. Waterloo is very hilly, so it made the cavalry a lot harder to use properly. And so it was really, again, Napoleon's problems of geography that led him to being defeated at Waterloo. So there's a couple different examples there where we have different battles where he lost due to geography. You can even argue that his defeat at Trafalgar 
was an issue of geography because he wasn't really that good of a sailor. That wasn't his main area of expertise. He was a land army general, not a naval, you know. So that was, again, an example of him not really being able to deal with geography. All right, so this is a picture showing the troops coming back from Russia. And you just gotta imagine, this is how bad it was. And we're talking all kinds of problems. Guys are hungry, they're cold, uh, they're constantly in danger from the harassment of the uh, Russian troops. And we're talking about a situation where horses are dropping dead from the cold and the troops butcher them and eat them so they have something to eat. You know, uh, it's pretty bad stuff. This graph is kind of interesting. I don't think you guys have ever seen it. It's actually in Mr. Armstrong's room. But what it shows, as you can see, is the success of the losses of French army soldiers during the Russian campaign, starting at a little over 400,000, ending at 10,000. And this is the different months. And right here, corresponding to it, is the temperature. So as you can see, as it's getting colder, they're losing more and more people. It's a pretty brutal situation. Winter fighting sucks. Right. So as we said, his second reign is fairly short-lived, and when he loses, he's pushed to exile. So let's talk about Napoleon's legacy. It's a fairly mixed one, I should think. Uh, Napoleon is remembered for being a warmonger and a tyrant, and he was. However, he also contributed many beneficial things to the world. For instance, he got rid of the old naval conventions like the Holy Roman Empire so that we could begin a new modern age. He brought around the possibilities that were going to lead to the Industrial Revolution. He spread the Code Napoleon. It's a system of law that's still around throughout the world to this day. So, I mean, he had a lot of good contributions despite the fact he was also a bloodthirsty warmonger. However, one of the biggest problems in Napoleon's reign is the paranoia it causes. No one wants to see another poll. And so this means the balance of power becomes an even more important and imperative doctrine. We have to keep the balance. But someone's always going to be a little bit stronger. So alliances are continuously shifting. And this means, in addition, that not all alliances between nations are well known. They're secret treaties. So it actually causes a situation of paranoia that's going to result in more war. In fact, this attitude is directly responsible for the greatest war the world will have ever seen. Some folks just call it the Great War. We call it World War I. It's going to be a cataclysm unlike anything anyone has ever seen. But we'll get to that one. Any questions on your list? Fantastic. Okay. Well, you should now have everything you need for the test. So I will upload this, and you guys can have the rest of the period to do any research you want to do on.